This is Forbidden Speech: The Raw Truth with your host Christina Rivera. In this savvy broadcasting series, we delve into hot topics affecting us all. With cancel culture and big tech censoring any opposing ideas and thoughts outside of mainstream ideology, it has become more important than ever that we tell the raw truth about everything from U.S. world politics, COVID, Christianity, and everything in between. We invite all points of view to come and share their perspective honestly and respectfully. Hi, Cami Wolf Rice. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, our Forbidden Speech: The Raw Truth series. I'm so grateful to have you speak today because we're talking about an important issue we've never covered on any of our Savvy shows, and that is. Opioid addiction—it's become a big thing across the nation. People who would have never thought they'd even have an issue with opioids have become addicted, and there, it's quite easy. My husband, when he had his two surgeries, they gave him a whole huge bottle of, you know, opioids, and he's just like, "Well, maybe I should not like take most of these and and restrict them because they are extremely addictive." And you've written a book documenting some of your.、Uh, You know, journey with your your son, who unfortunately you lost the flight. My opioid journey.、Um, discuss a little bit about what brought you to share your story and bring this out to the public. Thank you so much, Christina. I really appreciate the platform, and really, I'm trying to speak anytime I'll get a microphone of anybody that can listen, just to really reach the masses. Is my goal. I don't want any other parents to go through the loss of a child.、Um, there's no word in the dictionary when you lose your children because it is out of a natural order. And、um, my son. Went into the hospital. He was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in eighth grade, and then, for those of you who don't know about the disease, it's a colon disease, and it's miserable. You have diarrhea fifteen, twenty times a day,、um, and then when he became a senior in high school, he、um, had to have his large intestine removed. They were worried about colon cancer,、mm-hmm. and you know, anytime we're in a health crisis, right?、Um, it's scary, and This was 25 plus years ago, Christina, and so this was right when Purdue Pharma released OxyContin as the wonder drug, and informed doctors that it wasn't addictive. When in fact it was, and we went home with 90 OxyContins followed by 90 more, and at the time. I didn't know any better. I didn't, you know, we don't ask doctors questions, right? We we are the authoritative in the white jacket, and and、um, I didn't ask questions. I did exactly what I was told and giving him those pills every four hours.、Wow. And you know, Christina, this this was a boy that was an AP student. He wanted to be a Navy SEAL. He was super disciplined, and the. Opioids literally hijacked his brain. He fought addiction for over half of his life.、Mm. We did multiple rehabs. We did everything that we could possibly do, and ultimately, you know, he went into the hospital with one disease, and he came out with another disease that took his life.、Um, February twenty sixth, two thousand sixteen. Wow, you know this is、uh, so horrible to hear. I, I know my my husband had he has ulcerative colitis, but he has AS, so it's、uh, ankylosing spondylitis. It affects the spine. He's had such severe、um, pain through his life, and and thank God he's always decided I'm going to deal with the pain, go through it, and not take any pills because thanks to hearing from people like you about how the addictive qualities of these opioids are, he purposely stayed away from them. But if you don't know better, like you said, you go in, the doctor gives you these pills, you think he's the authority, he's helping me, he's giving me something that's going to make me better. Why wouldn't you just take it?、Mm-hmm. And eighty eighty percent of heroin users started with a prescription. Eighty percent. So I think that you know the people don't realize the danger, and you know there's a lot of people that are in chronic pain and have、mm-hmm. been on opioids for a long time, and it's it's not the sustainable answer. There are many many side effects. There are many things, other things you can do for pain、um, in place of taking that opioid, and it is like I said, quite addictive. And you have to. It doesn't. You need one stronger, and then you need more stronger, and then you, that's why you move to something else. And you know, doctors are now being monitored on prescription writing, and we have seen a decrease in prescription writing with opioids. 
But now people that have been on opioids with chronic pain can't get that. And that leads to other things, right? So we really, at Christopher Wolf Crusade, um, our swim lane, because there's many lanes to addiction and there's many ways and many pathways Mm -hmm. that people can become addicted. And when I, you know, I honestly... I, I sat in fetal position for two years after he died um, because, you know, the loss of a child is just horrific, but I knew I had to take that pain and turn it into purpose. Mm-hmm. And so I picked one of the hardest things to do, which, um, but I felt it was so a missing piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look at our society, Christina, we use coaches for everything. Yeah. We have executive coaches and birthing coaches and workout coaches. But when you're in a health crisis and you're in the hospital, there's no health coach to get you through the pain, the anxiety, the stress, the depression, the PTSD, mm-hmm. all the things that go with a health crisis. And so I really felt like there was a missing person from the healthcare team in hospitals. And I based the position on everything that my son didn't have those multiple times in the hospital and that I did not have Mm -hmm. as a caretaker. And so fast forward, we're two years in, we've had a clinical trial. It's on clinicaltrial.gov. It's an official clinical trial because you have to have the data, which I understand that. So I I got the data. Now we were able to continue the trial through COVID, which the silver lining was patients couldn't even see their families, right? During COVID. So we were able to have, the position is called a life care specialist and their job is to be your care coach. That's their number one job. And their job is to give you other alternative solutions to manage your pain. Hmm. And so we've all been trained by the Trauma Resource Institute with techniques that you can do literally from bedside to help you with anxiety and stress. Mm -hmm. And we educate you about the dangers of the, if you have to be on opioids, the dangers of taking the pills, how fast you need to taper off so that you don't become addicted. And, you know, almost 70% of the people that the population that we serviced didn't know they were either didn't know they were taking an opioid or didn't know what an opioid was. And so, yes, education, awareness, prevention, stopping addiction before it starts is the role of a life care specialist. In addition, we do follow up. When you leave the hospital, we check you at two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks to make sure your pain's being managed properly, to make sure that you're off opioids if you can be, um, and then provide, like I said, other techniques to help you with that pain. Wow, uh, this is amazing. We had a doctor on a couple of years ago who is a pain management specialist and that he's made it his goal as a doctor to really focus on that because he saw just what you saw, this epidemic. And he wanted to stove people away from going towards just taking the medications and not being aware of the side effects and, and such. But now I have a question for you. I've heard that as a patient going through pain, that stress of the event and not knowing what's going on or not having the knowledge or the empowerment actually makes the patient feel more pain. Does stress, have you seen stress cause a big uh, factor in pain and pain management? A hundred percent, Christina, you're so right on. I mean, honestly, when you look at pain, you have to integrate in the mental well-being of a patient. Mm-hmm. It's mind, body, spirit, right? And so you have to manage. And that is, again, the care coach's responsibility is to work with you and help you eliminate those stresses and those anxieties. And we have a toolkit with many, many different things we use because we all experience pain differently, right? Mm-hmm. And so something that might work for me might not work for you. And so we have a lot of different things that we can select to find out what is right with that patient. And the other thing that we do is a risk assessment tool where we ask questions of the patient. Many times there's history of addiction in a family. Uh, Many times, and you know, they've have a, they have, the patient has a history with substance misuse. And so you need to be aware of that. And a lot of times it's not like the doctor doesn't want to do it, but first of all, they, Doctors, specifically nurses, don't have the time to spend with patients, yeah. right? We're in a nursing crisis right now. Bless their hearts. You know, mm-hmm. they went to become nurses so that they could offer these skills and they just don't have the time to do it. Mm-hmm. And if you look at uh, educating our doctors and our nurses, mm-hmm. they get little to zero 
zero education on addiction, which is scary, right? Because let me be clear. I think people are unaware. You hear so many numbers, right? You hear so many numbers of people dying. And if it doesn't affect you, you go, oh, that's not my problem. I'm not going to look at that. But one in three families are dealing with this. And if you're not, put your seatbelt on because the odds are, and that's why it's so important to educate people and for them to be aware because this is the largest epidemic any of us will ever see in our lifetime. Wow. Think about that. The largest, I mean, more than people died in the Vietnam War, more than people died in 9-11. I mean, this is literally over a hundred people a day are dying. And, and that's why we need to wake up and be aware and, and have Narcan in your home. And, you know, I want to, I want to pivot and definitely talk about fentanyl as well. You know, there's so many uh, elements to this, but, 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 you know, that's the purpose of writing the book because I really, really wanted to hit the masses. And that's the reason I wrote the book. Well, you know, Cammie, I'm, I'm getting at something here as we go deeper into this subject so many kids in school are, are, are diagnosed with certain, you know, um, things, say ADHD or whatever it might be. And the idea is, oh, I'm, I have anxiety disorder, I have ADHD, and oh, here's a med for you. And so it's become common in our culture, both requested deeply, and this is what I heard from that doctor who came on a couple of years ago, the pain management doctor, is that patients will come in almost demanding, give me this medication. I saw it on this commercial and it's going to make all my woes go away. And, and he has to, you know, educate them and say, no, I, I'm not going to just give you these medications. I know there's commercials trying to sell it to you, but it's for a reason they're trying to make money. Um, but I, I want to get your opinion on what you think about all the different medications we kind of throw at people to solve problems. Does this also contribute to a lot of the you know, drug academic epidemics we see, including uh, opioid addictions? A hundred percent. You know, Christina, the answer we have been taught as a society and marketed as a society that the answer is in a pill and we rush to go do something, right? Rush to yeah. take a Tylenol, rush to take this, rush to take that. Mm. When sometimes if you drink a big glass of water, right? <laughs> or, you know, you sit down and you ground yourself and you, you know, that's why we have all these techniques where literally it doesn't cost you to go out and see somebody. These are mm. things that you can you, you use yourself to control your own nervous system mm. when you're feeling that anxiety and that stress. And yes, we, we have to understand that there is an element of pain if you're having a surgery. Mm -hmm. So you have to set a clear expectation ahead of surgery or ahead of that you you have, if you're going into the hospital for procedure, you got to buckle up, put your big boots on. And there, like I said, there's little techniques you can do that will really help. And don't always look for the solution in a pill. Mm -hmm. Now, I have critics come after me and say, oh my gosh, I'm in chronic pain. You know, you're, yeah. you're taking away my pain medicine. You have no heart. I've been a lot of things. And there is a time for opioids. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, they were originally produced, re- released to help as a palliative care when you are transitioning and passing away. Mm-hmm. And then it moved into mainstream. Now, are there good uses for it when you've had a car accident or a major injury? Absolutely. But it only is there for temporary. It is not a long-term solution, period. It is not sustainable. It is not good for your body to take them long-term. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm guessing most people listening in should, like you said, uh, when you start to get that uh, idea like, oh, you know, I've been diagnosed with ADHD. Let me get on this medication. Maybe just pause and say, okay, maybe medication isn't always the best route. And sometimes it is, but to take that pause to ask some more questions. And I I love the idea of having health care, um, coaches that can help you make better decisions, um, in the future so that patients, cause I think that's one thing as a patient, you might go on Google, but you're not getting the best information there. I mean, right. you could actually set yourself into being a hypochondriac by going online going, okay, I need 20 n- new net medications. I now have diagnosed myself with a billion different things by looking on, on uh, MD, MedMD or whatever. Or yes. doc- yeah. And so it becomes very dangerous. And I think that's why some doctors, when patients come in kind of demanding medications or, 
or um, diagnoses. They're like, listen, I went to medical school. It took like 11 years. Uh, you are a patient. And uh, I think it, it's best for both sides to maybe educate themselves saying, how can we come at this as a team? You know, maybe you have some ideas that we, we can look into, but I am the expert, but being open to the patient and the patient being open to the doctor and working together. That's right. And, you know, there's there is tremendous stigma around addiction and that needs to leave. OK, yeah, yeah. because it took me two years to say my son overdosed because mm -hmm. I wanted my son to have a respectable death. And that mm -hmm. is sickening because mm -hmm. what happens is in my son's case, right, he didn't sign up to be an addict mm -hmm. and it literally hijacks your brain. And so it is a disease and it needs to be treated as a disease. And we have to break the silence because silence kills. Yeah. If I said my son had leukemia, there would have been casseroles at my front door, right? Yeah. And, and, and I would have had a support team around me. But because of the stigma, I was guilty of it, right? I didn't want anyone to think bad of my son. I didn't want anyone to think bad of Christopher. And when you say addict, and the words that go around, if you look at the vocabulary around mm. this space, yeah. abuse, drug abuse, mm. it's all negative terminology. Yeah. And we've got to stop that as a country because we need people. You need to connect with people. If you are dealing with substance misuse, if you yeah. are, you have a family member dealing with it, mm -hmm. you've got to come out and share it so that you can get the support that you need. Mm -hmm. And if there are going to be people that are going to stigmatize, those are not your people. Mm -mm. Now, I'd love for you to go deeper on the hijacking of the brain, because I, I told you when we before we started the interview, we had issues in our family with a very close family member dealing with addiction. And you know, we didn't understand what is wrong with this person. Why can't they just go about and say what they're going to do and do what they're going to do and, and just stick to it. And it wasn't that easy. And so explain more about the hijacking of brain. What's going on there? Well, it does. It, it literally takes over your brain, the receptors in your brain, the opioids. It tells your brain mm -hmm. you have to have more. You have to have more. You have to have more. And it doesn't stop. You know, and people are, we are all addicted to something, right? If it's yeah. coffee in the morning, if it's, <laughs> day, right. Yeah. And if somebody said, you're not going to get your coffee, right? Okay. Now take that and magnify it by a billion. And that's what that, that's what your brain is telling you. Once you've been exposed for a long time with opioids, it's, I got to have more. I got to have more. I got to have more. I got to get higher. I got to have high, much more medication. And then they move on to stronger medication. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it just goes down a hill that you don't ever want to get in that case. And that's really why I wanted to focus on prevention. Yeah. But, but if you, if you become addicted there, number one, many people, many people like your family member get on the other side, but it is a long term. It's a lifetime disease. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to connect, have connection with people and support. Mm -hmm. Um, there's many different apps now that are out there for alcoholics, for, you know, uh, people that are self-medicating, because if you peel the onion back many times, there are other issues, other comorbidities that are causing you to want that to, to numb yourself, right. To mm -hmm. take away that pain. Mm -hmm. So you might have, uh, maybe you've been sexually abused or maybe you've been physically abused or, mm -hmm. uh, you have bipolar, there's other things, depression, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you're trying to self-medicate yourself and numb yourself from that pain. Mm -hmm. And so that needs compassion, yeah. right? That maybe needs a listening ear, a connection with people. So we need to come as a, as a community around and let's break this stigma mm -hmm. and help people because people are dying every single day, yeah. every day. And what I'm getting from you here is that once you're able to really open up and see where is the, oh God, I had this life coach once who was talking about, we all often have wounds inside of ourselves that we don't, we cover up sometimes with addiction, sometimes with uh, things we wouldn't even call addictions, like working a lot, you know, as a workaholic or whatever, um, different ways to deal with not dealing with the pain. And, and sometimes you just have to go deeper to uncovering the layers. And, and once you do, so it's kind of like a, a healing of your, your spirit. And once your spirit and your mind heal, then your body's able to heal. 
Yes. You have to look at it. Like I said earlier about mind, body, spirit, Mm -hmm. you have to look at your emotional well-being as well. And, you know, mental illness used to, it's still, it's getting a lot better because people are talking about it. Um, But it used to be very stigmatized as well. And I don't know why being sick in the brain is different than sick in the kidney, you know, or the Mm -hmm. liver or the lungs or whatever. It's so Mm -hmm. stigmatized. It just doesn't make sense. And I think maybe it's because we had mental hospitals earlier on and we all have this Mm -hmm. vision of what somebody that mentally is struggling. But I think, I think a lot of people are struggling. This is kind of the aftermath of COVID. There's been Mm -hmm. a lot of loss, a lot of social unrest in our community and our world. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, and, and especially at the holidays, mm-hmm. it's very hard for people. Um, there's a, is grief when you're missing yeah. a family member or a friend or yeah. a spouse or a child, it's, it's a hard time as well. And, and so that's, that's the reason I wrote the book. And, you know, you mm-hmm. asked me earlier before we started, like why the airplane, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's called the flight and, you know, first of all, I'm not a writer. This is my first book. I'm super proud of it though, because yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. It was 18 grueling months. Mm-hmm. It was not easy uh, because I had to bring up a lot of things that were very difficult when Christopher was ill that I'd kind of put up on a shelf in the corner of what I went through. Right. Yeah. But the reason I used a flight is it's so hard to explain to someone what it's like to lose a child. It's different. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's just very different. And I think even more different uniquely different for a mother as well. So I use an airplane as a metaphor, as our journey of life. And so we land at different places in our life. We land at happiness and success and, Mm -hmm. and, and then we landed illness and grief Mm -hmm. and people that we thought were going to be on our flight, our entire, entire journey, leave our flight. And then new people get on our flight that we didn't expect. And so I use that almost in a dream phase throughout the book of going on and off the flight to mm-hmm. describe what I went through. Mm-hmm. But the book is became so much more than about me. Mm-hmm. I got to tell you, I had a lot of help from upstairs because mm-hmm. it, you know, there's a lot of words in a book and the words that speak out in my book are forgiveness mm-hmm. and compassion and hope and love and um really giving i think people that the feedback that i've gotten i released it i had a pre-release on my son's heavenly birthday in september Mm -hmm. then the book officially launched nationally in october on my birthday Mm -hmm. so i thought why not have some you know specialness to it and the feedback i've gotten is people think about their own journey throughout the whole book it makes you reflect on your journey Mm -hmm. and I've had a woman say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to open up this new bakery because I read your book. And I was like, okay, wait, that has nothing to do with losing a child. It has nothing to do with the opioid epidemic. I said, do you mind if I dig a little deeper on that? And she said, yes, because it made me think about my own journey and it gave me hope and inspired me that I could do what I needed to do and put purpose in my life. And Mm. I was like, wow, you know, so it really is about um, your own personal journey. And the other thing I got to share, I'm super excited about it. I don't know if you've ever heard about it. So you tell me, but it was right after COVID. And I, you know, we go to a restaurant. If you want to eat, you have Mm. to learn how to scan the QR code, right? Yeah. For the menu to get to see the menu, right? QR codes. And I'm sitting there and I was like, you know what? I'm going to put a QR codes in my book. Hmm. So in the back of my book, I have a resource library. It has a music playlist. It has resources, how to talk to your children, how to have resources. If you have a family member that's struggling, there's a whole library that I able to keep current Mm -hmm. because it's a QR code. So it's always going to stay updated. And then I did a QR code after every chapter. Mm. So you scan it and a video comes up of me and I just talk just a little bit. It's only a few minutes, a little bit of extra content to the chapter of what you've read. And so that was really fun to do as well. So I'm excited that I'm going to be able to keep all the information up to date, even though the book's been printed. Wow. And that is such a unique way 
to uh, touch base with the reader in, in just a different way that I've not seen done before. And, you know, you hit on something just before that, uh, where you said you touched someone that made them think, hey, what am I going to do with my life here? This is giving me purpose and hope. And I'm going to go do that dream of mine of opening a bakery. And just this morning, morning, I heard a podcast where the the guest or host, excuse me, was mentioning the fact that everyone can do something in their life that's extraordinary, just living your best life, whatever it is, can inspire, inspire the person next to you. you think, ah, oh, what do I do? I just, you know, go and do a job every day, but living a life of excellence and doing your best and living your potential to whatever it is at this moment, at this time in your life will inspire others to go live their best life. Absolutely. I, I just can't tell you that enough about my personal experience mm -hmm. to be able to take the pain and put purpose. And it doesn't mean you have to start a charity or that you have to do something big. Mm -hmm. Having purpose can mean little things. Mm -hmm. It could mean going to a nursing home and visiting with people that never get family members to visit them. It could be going to an animal shelter. Mm -hmm. It could be just helping somebody move because you know what a stress it is to move. Mm -hmm. It's just literally feeling purposeful and, and feeling like you've done something to make a difference with somebody else's life. Yeah. And that is what makes my heart sing for me, I got to say. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, I don't want anyone to leave here without finding out more about the flight and also how they can get in contact with you if they're also struggling, having a family member struggle uh, with your organization and maybe contributing, donating. How can they do that? Thank you so much. Um, so my book, The Flight, is on Amazon and it is on Barnes and Nobles online. I want to also state every single profit penny which Amazon and everybody else takes their big old cut, but every penny goes to the charity to help people. I'm not taking any money for myself at all. So I want to make sure that's clear. Um, so you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on uh, Barnes and Nobles online. And then our website for our charity is it's, so the name of the charity is Christopher Wolf Crusade. And our website is cwc.ngo. NGO. And we have resources there. Um, we also, oh, I also have my own website, camiewolfrice.com. So you awesome. can go there as well. Awesome. I'll put both in your news, uh, in the uh, show notes as well. And also in the lower third um, for anyone who happens to be watching us. But I just have to thank you again. This has been so instrumental, insightful. And I hope anyone who has a family member or the them themselves are dealing with uh, op opioid or any addiction that they go get the help they need and uh, get your book and hopefully work through and not feel like they're in it alone because they're not. There's a lot That's of people to help them. Yeah. Thank you for this Thanks. platform. I really appreciate it, Christina, because you just made a difference because somebody out there today is listening that needed to hear this. So thank you so much. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> bless you, Cammie. Thank you for coming to Savvy Broadcasting today. Have a great day and happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas. Like, subscribe, and share this episode. To listen to more Forbidden Speech or Savvy episodes, visit SavvyBroadcasting.com. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest, email Christina at LifeUnscriptedRadio.com.